Sisi. You just heard excerpts of letters from prison written by Leila Zana, who was a member of Turkish Parliament. We would like to thank you for listening to us, and many thanks to Sally Phillips, Susan Stone, Kristen Thomas for all their hard work. For more information for our programs, please check our website on www.me-radio.org. Thank you again. Thanks for joining us. Till next time, have a wonderful time. And International Women's Day continues. Thank you so much for staying with us here throughout the night till midnight, 94.1 FM. Programs uh, that you normally hear at this time will be heard next week. Our thanks to New Dimensions. They will return next Monday at their usual time at 1 p.m. A note about an earlier program today, um, Arlie Hostchild, who was speaking at noon with Sasha Lilly, the author of Global Woman, will be speaking tonight at the Global Fund for Women at Fort Mason, Building A in San Francisco at 7 p.m. That's Arlie Hochschild, and she'll be talking tonight, Building A, women, uh, Global Fund for Women at Fort Mason. For more information, call 415 415- 202-7640-415-202-7640. Coming up in just a few moments, it's stress reduction for busy people, finding peace in an anxious world. With Rangita Giesler, who hosts our program, stay with us. We are the ones, we are the ones, we've been waiting. We are the ones, we've been waiting. We are the ones. My name is Nicholas Welch. Today on International Women's Day, we bring the voices of children of KPFA as we read literature produced by great women. We are the children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, nieces, nephews, and friends of the KPFA community. The thread that connects and runs through the readings is the love that children give to mothers, to women, and to mother. Grandma Moses, life is what we make it, always has been, always will be. You're listening to KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, or KFCF in Fresno. Happy International Women's Day. Stay tuned for About Health with guest host, Shalene. Welcome to About Health. I'm Shalene Qualls, one of Dr. Lenore's co-hosts. And today at KPFA, we're celebrating International Women's Day. And on our show, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to start with a few poems by African-American women poets Jackie Early and Nikki Giovanni. I'm going to read a classic piece of hers for that. After that, I'm going to um, share a few excerpts with you from a narrative I wrote when I attended the the uh, Fourth United Nations World Conference on Women, which took place in Beijing, China, eight years ago. Um, so much of what we learned and experienced there is still so relevant today. Uh, some of the statistics I'm going to mention certainly have changed, but um, unfortunately, they've only gotten worse. Um, then we're going to be taking your calls as we talk with our special guest, Don Groves, minister, educator, and author of a wonderful book, Stress Reduction for Busy People. And hopefully Don can help us figure out how to create some good news in our life as we're, you know, contemplating all the serious things that are going on in the world. She's also written yoga for busy people, meditation for busy people, and massage for busy people. So... Let me start with a few poems by Jackie Early. The first one is called, How Human Are You? How human are you? Did you wake up this morning with a smile on your face? Did you sleep on the left side and breathe through the right space? 
Did you bless yourself after your rest? Fill your machine with the very best? Are you, do you still throw everything in there, ignoring the process of refinement, being fine, divine? Define how human are you? Did you ask yourself today, self, what can I do? And what will I do for you and you and you? How human are you? Did you give something away today? Did you empty your cup so fortune can fill it up? Will you make some creative time work while the sun shines? Then give in to the nighttime, manage to kiss somebody, happen to miss somebody, see through some other body, touch somebody body to body, cause your soul to be loved, feel all the sky above. How human are you and how human will you be? Her next poem is called Believe. I believe in myself, the woman alrighty, creature of earth and heaven, and in her divine sign Taurus, from whence she was born, suffered under Pontius politics, was crucified, died, and was married. She ascended on the third day and now sitteth at the center of life. I believe in proper breathing, the church of living and giving, and life with no limits. Oh, man. Now, the two poems um, by Nikki Giovanni, one's called Revolutionary Dreams. These were both written, I think, in late 60s. I used to dream militant dreams of taking over America to show these folks how it should be done. I used to dream radical dreams of blowing everyone away with my perceptive powers of correct analysis. I even used to think that I'd be the one to stop the riot and negotiate the peace. Then I awoke and dug that if I dreamed natural dreams of being a natural woman, doing what a woman does when she is natural, I would have a revolution. And this is finally Ego Tripping, a real classic of Nikki Giovanni's. I was born in the Congo. I walked to the Fertile Crescent and built the Sphinx. I designed a pyramid so tough that a star that only glows every 100 years falls into the center, giving divine, perfect light. I am bad. I sat on the throne drinking nectar with Allah. I got hot and sent an ice age to Europe to cool my thirst. My oldest daughter is Nefertiti, and the tears from my birth pains created the Nile. I am a beautiful woman. I gazed on the forest and burnt out the Sahara Desert. With a packet of goat's meat and a change of clothes, I crossed it in two hours. I am a gazelle so swift, so swift you can't catch me. For a birthday present when he was three, I gave my son Hannibal an elephant. He gave me Rome for Mother's Day. My strength flows ever on. My son Noah built new ark, and I stood proudly at the helm as we sailed on a soft summer day. I sow diamonds in my backyard. My bowels deliver uranium. The filings from my fingernails are semi-precious jewels. On a trip north, I caught a cold and blew my nose, giving oil to the Arab world. I am so hip, even my errors are correct. I sailed west to reach east and had to round off the earth as I went. The hair from my head thinned and gold was laid across three continents. I am so perfect, so divine, so ethereal, so surreal. I cannot be comprehended except by my permission. I mean I can fly like a bird in the sky. So thanks to Jackie Early and Nikki Giovanni for those poems. Now, on the 75th anniversary of the women's right to vote in America, I was fortunate to be a representative of the global women's movement attending the largest conference in United Nations history. And in this sea of women dividing lines between, dividing lines between cultures and countries disappeared, it was a celebration. And here are just a few of my notes. There I was, American African woman, eyes filling up on the sights and sounds of colorful multitudes of beautiful, groundbreaking, earth-shaking sisters humming and amening, dancing and demanding, planning and building above-ground mine shelters, saving little sisters for the 21st century. 
my ears perking up at the call to come to meetings, my mind mixed up trying to decide which of the over 5,000 workshops to attend, my spirit soaring marching through Huairu and Beijing, thinking about my favorite mothers of our women's movement, Sojourner Truth and Lucretia Mott. In the rain, in the sun, on the great wall and in the halls, we waved to one another as our ribbons of hope flew by. A 1,000-meter long work of art sewn by thousands of sisters from Cambodia to Canada was carried to the Great Wall as women held hands, waved flags, sang, and danced, each banner a covering for someone suffering, now a comfort for hopes and dreams weaving the world's women together. We shivered as women in black marched silently by for peace in the world, inspired by the mothers of the disappeared in Argentina. Their movement began in Israel with Israelis and Palestinians protesting the treatment of the Palestinians, their candles lighting the darkness in Palestine, Bosnia, Cyprus, and Somalia. African Americans crying as sisters from the African continent danced and sang and held hands with them in the rain, blessing their bond and performing ceremonies ancient and deep for them. The unforgettable sights of women from 24 Asian and Pacific countries dancing joyously together in their friendship tents singing, We Shall Overcome, and other occasions seeing women from around the world wringing out their hearts singing South Africa's national anthem. Queen Fabiola of Belgium, Queen Madaho of Tonga, First Ladies of Nigeria, Senegal, Rwanda, Gambia, El Salvador, Iceland, Egypt, Pakistan, the United States, and others all were there. Betty Shabazz was there. Bella Abzug, Jane Fonda, Anna DeVere Smith, Susan Taylor, Judy Woodruff, Diane Feinstein. We danced to the Nordic Jazz Band, sang with Sweet Honey in the Rock, swayed to the sound of Odetta, saw hundreds of women in performance each night. And we had passionate exchanges at times, like the day a female journalist was challenged about her commitment to fem feminism. She was asked, are you a journalist or are you a feminist? Whereupon the journalist lifted her t-shirt, grabbed her breasts, and said, these are always the same. We were there 31,000 strong from every country in the world except Saudi Arabia, which was not ready for its women to witness this revolution. It was the largest and most diverse gathering of the world's women in history. In plenary sessions, we sat soberly and listened to statistics of war, civil strife, and ethnic conflicts. During the past decade, more than one and a half million children were killed, over four million permanently disabled, and 12 million left homeless, and still another 10 million traumatized by conflict and war. Women are 80% of the casualties of war. Systematic mass rape and forced impregnation have been used as weapons of war or in ethnic cleansing in many countries, including Cambodia, Cyprus, Liberia, Peru, Somalia, and Uganda. More than 20,000 Muslim women are estimated to have been raped in Bosnia. Asian sisters reported that the growth miracle associated with parts of Asia was built on the exploitation of women's labor. We heard testimony from women who told us about the 20,000 women from Korea who were sexual slaves of the Japanese Imperial, Imperial Army, the comfort women, as they are called, demanding an official apology from the Japanese government and reparations. The Chinese Post newspaper reporting that over one million boys and girls are serving as prostitutes for tourists and foreign businessmen in Asia. UNICEF reported there are 300,000 child prostitutes in India, 100,000 in Thailand, 100,000 in Taiwan, 100,000 in the Philippines, 40,000 in Vietnam, 30,000 in Sri Lanka, and thousands in mainland China. We heard stories of women around the world who today are enslaved, tortured, mutilated, and killed. Women who are beheaded in Algeria. We saw scenes of life through the lives of eyes of African women throughout the world who continue to be marginalized by those who believe in biological racial superiority. We shuddered at the number of women living in absolute poverty, which had increased by over 50% over the last 20 years. Of the 1.3 billion people subsisting on less than $1 a day, more than 70% are women. Two-thirds of the world's illiterate are women. Women work two-thirds of the world's working hours and earn one-tenth of the world's income and own less than one-tenth of the world's property. Of the 11 million adults affected with AIDS, 40% of women, soon more than 50% will be women. 
At the opening plenary session, Winona LaDuke talked about the disregard of Earth and the rights of indigenous people numbering 500 million. Indigenous people account for half the population of places like Ecuador, Guatemala, and Bolivia, but have no role in government and are oppressed and poor. She said decisions at the U.N. are made not by thousand-year-old nations of indigenous people, but by the 180 member states who have been in existence for only 200 years. And in truth, most of those decisions are made by the 47 transnational corporations whose annual income often exceeds the gross national product of many countries. The right to make those decisions are no longer human rights, but rights based on wealth and power, which are made at the cost of millions of lives, species of plants, animals, forests, and entire ecosystems. But with all of that somber news that we work to address in our daily lives, I just wish there had been a tool similar to the instruments used to measure the earthquakes that could possibly have measured the E-factor in Beijing. The E-factor refers to the energy created by the estrogen present at the conference. I'm sure it would register the highest reading ever recorded. Thank goddess, children were there, teens were there, grandmothers for peace were there, men too speaking out for women the same way Frederick Douglass did at the first international women's conference in Seneca Falls in New York in the 1800s. In the rain, in the sun, on the Great Wall, and in the halls, we shared our stories. Sisters, mothers, lovers, daughters, friends, businesswomen, women, artists, politicians, teachers, scientists, engineers, women involved in communications, and lots and lots of lawyers, city women, rural women, women with a mission, women wishing to turn things around for women, men, and children everywhere. The woman who came up for the idea of the first women's conference can no longer track where the nectar from her idea has gone. When we plant seeds and water the ground, we don't know where in heaven's name those seedlings will blow or how high our flowers will grow. So we just have to keep on walking the walk. And maybe we don't know where we'll end up, but we have to just start walking. Ellen DeGeneres once said, she was talking about her grandmother, and she said, my grandmother started walking five miles a day when she was 60. And she said that she's 93 today, and the family doesn't know where the hell she is. So we do know where we are today. We're here at KPFA, wonderful, precious, free speech radio. I'm Shaleen, Coase, Shaleen Qualls, co-host of About Health. And in just a minute, we're going to start with a wonderful guest who's going to help us deal with all the bad news in the world that causes our stress as our lives become more complex so that our cups do runneth over, not runneth on empty. Just a moment. I'm so happy to welcome Don Groves to About Health. Um, hello, Don. Hello, Shalene. <laughs> and Don, you are. Tell us where you are exactly, so we can I'm visualize in, uh, you. I'm up in <laughs> Bellingham, Washington. Mm-hmm. So I'm very close to the Canadian border right now. Great. Well, Don is the author of Stress Reduction um, for Busy People. She's an educator. She's a minister, and she's gonna help us. Um, take some of the stress out of our lives. So, Don, first, would you tell me why you wrote the book? Well, um, I I experienced, uh, like most people, I'm in the business community, and I experienced a lot of the day-to-day stress that that so many women go through. And um, I made a decision that I was going to try to find a way to use this experience as opposed to just sort of endure it. When I um, presented the idea of writing a stress reduction book to New World Library, my publisher, they said, oh, yeah, that sounds good. And then my world fell apart. I was, uh, my mother had a stroke and became fairly psychotic, and uh, we had to move. There were several problems in our family, and so the world just kind of fell apart for me. And I actually had to put stress reduction on the back burner for a few months just to gather my life. And then I decided, you know, this is things happen for a reason. I mean, I can, 
I can either be a victim of this circumstance or I can put it to use and navigate it. And so that's what I did, and that's what the book came out of. Well, you know, it's so funny. Stress, you just, you just sort of accept that it's there as a part of life and that there's, you know, I think sometimes there's a feeling that there's no real solution, you know, because our lives are so demanding and out of control. So how do we approach, um, how do we approach eliminating some of it? It's interesting. Uh, people tend to think of, of stress as something that we have to get rid of, you know, that it's bad. In fact, our bodies are designed to deal with it. Uh, we're more than able to handle stress. The challenge is that we're living in a world now where uh, we're so information overloaded and we're getting so much uh, data from places where we really have no direct influence, things that we can't fix right now or uh, work on in the immediate, and yet we are dealing with that information and it's causing our bodies to jump up into hyper arousal and this over the long term becomes a way of life we begin to actually value being stressed out and that's what's happened mm -hmm. in north america uh, when you're stressed out you're busy you're active you're 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 going for it so uh, part of what we have to understand is that stress is natural but this constant high level that we're dealing with is really damaging to us and the way to make the decision to begin to eliminate it is to first make peace with the fact that it's always going to be there to some extent. Mm -hmm. We have to deal more with the idea of managing it as opposed to eliminating it. And that really involves a number of small but significant changes in how we approach life. Well, we want you to walk us through some of those. I want to first invite our audience to um, to call us at 510-848-4425. So can you tell us, you know, how you, how we, be, how we approach it? Certainly. As a matter of fact, I wrote a book about that. <laughs> it helped me, Don. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you know, okay. it's, there's a lot of different ways of, of talking about this, but... Uh, one thing that comes back to me over and over again is that I can't make the stress wrong if I fight it and say, I hate this, I have to change it, I have to do something about it. Uh, what happens is that I just fuel more and more anxiety. So one of the things that we need to do is to say, okay, this is the way my life is playing out right now. This is the stress that's here. Rather than hating it, I need to just say, what are some small things that I can do to take the edge off of it? For example, uh, when my mother had a stroke, I have two very young children and a husband that works in Seattle a lot, so he's gone for, you know, a week at a time, and it's a, it's, you know, it's a, and I'm a working woman, so this, this combination is very high stress. And when my, when I would get calls late at night, my mother was flipping out or something. Mm. I would say, okay, I've got to do just three things here. The first one is that I need to move my body. The second is I have to narrow my focus. And the third is take action. So the moving my body part could be as simple as just walking around the block or walking around the house or doing some stretches, some sort of physical movement that takes that rush of, oh, no, and moves it through the big muscles in my body. It gives a little bit of a break from that knee-jerk reaction that can get us into so much trouble. It gives a little bit of space. And we don't need much space in order to have a choice in what our next step is going to be. A little bit of room is really all that's required. So once I move my body, I'm then able to begin to narrow my focus and say, okay, what can I do? Can I do something about what's happening with, you know, my mother, for example? No, I have two children at home. Okay, I can't do something about that yet. Back it up. What can I do right now? What can I do in the next half hour? And sometimes it's as simple as, well, I can't do anything, so I need to just take action in a wholesome way that doesn't really directly affect that situation. So it might be just uh, cleaning out my purse or straightening up something, or going upstairs and uh, reading a story to the children, some sort of wholesome action. And that takes some of the stress off of my body, releases my mind a little bit, so that I can then do my next action, whatever that might be. 
So when these things come up, these sort of critical situations, if we can move to channel the anxiety, narrow to do something that re-empowers us, because a lot of stress comes from interpretation, from feeling disempowered. So if we can narrow to do something that re-empowers us and then take action on doing that, we're better able to tolerate the anxiety. And as soon as we move into empowerment, we move into more of a solution orientation. There's not always a solution. Now, that's just the way life is. But there is always action that can be taken, even a very small action. And that is healing. So small steps do matter. Very much. Small steps are really the only things that matter. Big things happen, but they happen in small steps. Now, sometimes there'll be a huge, you know, a growth spurt, but it's typically preceded by a series of small steps. Uh, the problem with a lot of us is that we devalue little steps. We think that, oh, you know, I have to take a pill and then it's all over with. You know, I've done, I've finished. Or I have to make this huge leap in in income level or in fitness level or in dealing with my relationships. And even if we can make a leap like that, it's kind of like uh, dramatic dieting. You know, there's a backlash that comes because the value of small steps is that learning takes place. And that's where change happens. When we can take a small step, there's a shift that occurs inside and it builds slowly. This is the way nature works. Uh, it builds uh, it's solid and there's a foundation. And not only that, what's really cool is that a small step feels good. I mean, we've forgotten how good it feels to do something little. If there's a, an empowerment that comes from taking a small step, the next step is a little bit easier. And when we do something that has a wholesome, noble quality, a healing behavior of some sort, it has a ripple effect in our lives. So the value that comes from that small, wholesome step affects other things. <laughs> and then everything begins to move uh, with more joy. There's growth that happens that doesn't have to come necessarily through suffering. But suffering does have, you know, it has its place in this world. It happens. There's nobody that can deny that. The and value in the valleys. You betcha. <laughs> yeah, because if we only value, you know, all the high points and say, oh, well, the valleys, you know, that's not, just get out of here. You know, we don't want to be here. Uh, if we don't value them and learn from them, then we're doomed to repeat them. We're talking today with our special guest, uh, Don Gross, who's written Stress Reduction for Busy People. You can call us at 510-848-4425 to share some of your experiences or, or ask uh, Don a question. Um, we have a caller on the line from Livermore. Paul, are you there? I think we have a pretty bad connection. We'll have to wait and... And let him come back, um, Don. Are we stressing our our? Is it is it more really that the stress is resulting from the way that we're handling our day to day lives, or or are we stressing ourselves out from our own thinking about our lives? Well, certainly, stress is a matter of perspective. You know, when you interpret something as threatening or scary, you get stressed out about it. Mm -hmm. But the world is. I don't know that it's a more scary place, but it's a more informed place. So all, we know about the scary things a lot more than we used to. And, you know, the downside of awareness is that then we know how, how threatened we can be. And this just increases this kind of general generalized anxiety uh, that people are experiencing. And it's very easy to talk about that. We sort of munch it around in groups, and then it builds. And everybody kind of agrees, oh, you know, what's the world coming to? It's easy to fall into that kind of thinking. And that kind of thinking is not solution-oriented. It's it's uh, after a certain point of, of saying, yes, this is happening, we need to move in to a mindset that is looking for a way to manage it or deal with it or solve it. And that's a more difficult frame of mind to maintain because it's not supported by kind of the consciousness of, of the country. So when we're dealing with stress reduction, we're really talking about almost going against grain. That's why we have to take it in small steps because otherwise we have to take lots of pills, you know, to try to calm us down, you know, uh, Valium, uh, because it's just too difficult to fight that uh, that overriding um, 
downward thinking uh, habit that so many of us have succumbed to. Let's go back to the phone. We have Tanya on the line from Benicia. Yes, hi. Um, thank you for taking my call. Um, I have kind of a complex um, situation, which I'm sure you, you have a good comment on. Um, what would you, um, what a pin, or, uh, what's the word, what suggestion could you give someone that is not only dealing with stress on a daily basis, but um, not only emotionally, but also physically, that it's not an option to not um, be reliant on medication. For example, um, I'm about to have my seventh uh, surgery. I had a, a terrible injury at the age of 19 where I fell as an athlete and broke my spine, and I've had to have all these reconstructive surgeries. Um, and um, every day... I'm, I'm struggling with not only severe amounts of pain, but also I'm suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, not only from the fall, but obviously from the ongoing um, trauma of all the surgeries and how I've been treated on and off by the, the doctors and the lack of follow-up and negligence and all the rest of it. Um, and it's not an option um, for me right now unless this seventh surgery can somehow get rid of the pain for me not to take my medication each day. So okay. I appreciate your response. Okay, thank you for your question. Tanya, that is quite a mm -hmm. load you're carrying. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't pretend to offer a solution to that because I think that uh, there isn't one. I think that you're doing the best you can with it. What I can do is I can um, acknowledge the stress that you're under and also uh, make the suggestion that you find a way of reframing it. Mm -hmm. um, I've had my share of physical issues, certainly nothing as um, long-term as what you're dealing with and, and scary, but I've dealt with cancer and other types of uh, physical immobility. And I found that the only way that I can get through it without driving myself insane <laughs> is by framing it in a way that um, gives it purpose. Mm -hmm. How can I use this? How can I use this to um, elevate myself or the people around me? It's like uh, these things occur and we have a choice. We can either just uh, give in to them and be miserable or we can make the effort to rise above them and I'm sure that you have tried that many times and are probably <laughs> going to continue to okay. but really you know as human beings we're faced with um, enormous pain in our lives at various times in our lives and um, nobody can change that pain we have to take it and 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 uh, ride it and use it for something. Find a way to make the suffering count, either through writing about it, uh, working with others who are going through similar types of things, uh, sharing it with people who need to hear our story, some way finding a way to give it vent and value. Because I do believe that there is purpose in suffering, um, I, and I can't always say what that purpose is because for each individual it's different. I might suggest a form of, if you don't do it already, to consider a meditation practices because there's a lot of research that supports them in being useful for pain management, but not just for that. They enable one to step back from the waterfall of thought that can cascade around these very dramatic, very painful suffering situations. And when we can step back from that waterfall of thought, there's more choice as to how we can handle them in a way that's wholesome and not utterly debilitating. So you have my great empathy and also my respect for the strength that you're obviously showing going through it. Tanya, thank you so much for calling us. Um, we have Paul back on the line. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Yeah, this is kind of in reference to the poem that that the host read about um, the human touch, and uh, I'm wondering about the stress of lack of marital relations with my wife of almost 28 years. I've known her 
34 years, and it's been six years since, uh, oh, well, any thoughts? Well, I um, I think that in, whenever you're dealing uh, with relationship pain, you know, there, there's there's two beings involved, and I don't know of any way to work through relationship pain without communication, without some form of sharing, and without some form of saying to yourself, what can I do here to make some small changes that can shift the trajectory of what's going on? Sometimes those small changes can be as simple as uh, relationship uh, counseling, just uh, going once a week to talk to someone. Sometimes they involve looking at our own behavior. Sometimes they just involve saying nothing and listening instead of talking. Uh, relationship stress is so complex, and we can't control what other people do, bottom line. They're going to do what they're going to do. The only thing that we can do is come from a place in our heart that's as wholesome and loving and empathetic as we can and uh, allow them to be heard and ask also that we can be heard. Even asking for that is taking a step in the direction of action. Our circle of influence when we're dealing with relationship with relationships really shifts around. Sometimes we have a lot of influence over people and sometimes we haven't got squat. You know, we're just sort of stuck with ourselves. So we have to decide what's going to what's going to um be most effective at the time. Um, I think also, and I, w- I emphasize this with the last caller as well, some form of a practice that enables one to step back from reactive thought so that you can take a kind of a spacious look at what's happening overall and be less uh, just knee-jerk, emotionally reactive. And for me, that uh, meditation works with that or some form of exercise that's repetitive that allows one to take a mental break from the, the drama. Don, for on. people who don't meditate regularly, mm-hmm. um, what what kind of practice do you um, do you, you suggest? You, Don also has a book called Meditation for Busy People, um, and that's part of the problem I think for meditation is just you know get it forcing ourselves to sit down and then sure so. sure meditation's a, a tough one if you feel like you're too busy to do it. I think part of it is that uh, one has to understand that meditation is uh, a process of training the mind. It's really a skill, and uh, skill development comes from practice, but it doesn't have to come from practice for like 30 and 45 minutes at a time. Sometimes you, you, know, you can do a meditation practice for five minutes, and you're beginning to train your mind. And what do we do? In the, how would somebody approach a five-minute meditation if they're starting? Well, the uh, what I suggest, it, it's, a, it's a form of meditation that's, that's used a lot in North America. It's called Vipassana, which means insight meditation. And it's focusing on the breath, watching the breath, so that when the mind is busy going with, oh, this is what that person said, this is my reaction, oh, no, what am I going to do here? The mind, you just keep coming back to watching the flow of breath over and over again. And it sounds mundane, but what it is doing is training us to, first of all, not believe our thoughts. Because if if stress is a matter of interpretation, then we need to separate ourselves enough from our thoughts so that we can say, wait a minute, that's not accurate. That doesn't make sense. I don't need to overreact to that. And learning how to say, oh, there goes fear instead of, oh, I am afraid is a critical distinction that can be taught just by this a uh, five minute practice uh, daily of um, watching the breath and coming back to the breath over and over again and then as we develop this skill we could be become better able to um, make intelligent decisions about what to do next and better able to determine what's really going on in our lives instead of uh, re- responding to something that's uh, got a thousand other things that are also contributing to it from our past. Thank you. I hope that helped, Paul. Thank you so much for calling us. We have, uh, in just a minute, Jeanette on the line from San Francisco. But first, I want to invite you to uh, call in with a question for our special guest, Don Groves, author of Stress Reduction for Busy People, Meditation for Busy People. Uh, she also has another great book called Massage for Busy People and Yoga for Busy People. We have to talk a little bit about yoga before you leave. Please call us at 510 Eight four eight four four two five. Jeanette. Hi. 
Hi. Thank you very much. Um, happy International Women's Day. Same to you. And, to you and uh, I wanted to say that um, I'm in accordance with everything that you're saying. I recently had a terrible year in which everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And in addition to that, um, a very dear minister at a, um, a gathering that I would go to had passed. And uh, I was feeling very alone. And I remember calling to her in my moment of greatest need when I was up against uh, um, an authority figure who made me, every time I looked at him, feel like I was going to have a heart attack. And I remembered my deceased uh, friend Norma of the Amron Church. And when I thought of her and her peaceful, beautiful face, I remembered everything she said about uh, the Divine Mother that's in every woman, that um, every stage of life, especially as you approach your wisdom years, is not a, a loss or franticness. In fact, the franticness is um, as if it is the Mother calling us within ourselves to feel our power. And when I was thinking, why, why is this, you know, this oppressive person who was a former DA after me, I realized because um, he needs a lesson only I can teach him. <laughs> and I somehow found my wits and my strength to stand up not only to that person, but to um, to find some semblance of sanity while my um, oldest girl was going through a mental breakdown. And um, oddly, like I would be out, and I felt um, when I was out, I would feel the most real walking, which I really feel what you're saying about just simple movements, just to be out under God's sky. And I felt grateful that I had my own life, you know, and that gratitude pulled me through. But I felt that the animals were talking to me, and they were giving me strength. And when I saw birds, you know, I felt like they could lift me up to where I could see the big picture. And even in the sounds of traffic, I heard the sounds of whales crying to one another, like out in the ocean, and I chanted to the whales, and that was my, like, um, one-second uh, meditative um, practice that I had. But to use, uh, I had found a book that told me about um, Namu Amida Butsu, which is the prayer to a compassionate goddess to um, lift me up. It means lift me up to where you are or come down to me where I am. And I felt unity that way. And I feel that what you're saying and what you're doing, especially with um, the person in pain who called, mm -hmm. is to reach out with that within yourself, which is like an invisible quality of strength that's universal, that you are giving the goddess through yourself and through your love that was in your voice to her, to show her and to show us all the way, you know, that we can find it within ourselves. You know, Jeanette, there's some really powerful things you've said, and one that's, but many of them have struck me, but one is that um, where you talked about you've, these these are difficult things that are happening, and then you focused on uh, this can minister who was a, a sure symbol for, for who you care about and what you know. And uh, what struck me is that you were using your experience and saying everything that happens to me, everything that is happening to me right now is for my awakening. It's, it's a gift for me to learn from, something for me to be gained from this. And that is such a powerful point of view for really moving into a solution orientation and also just valuing every step that's taken, whether it's moved forward or backward. Um, that's how I look at stuff. Everything that happens here is for my awakening. So when the when the really bad stuff happens, I say, okay, you know, this is happening. This is a happening for me to become more aware. How can I wake up through this and not become uh, more distant, uh, colder, or angrier? And uh, it sounds like you're doing a great job with that. Thank you. Let's go to Anna in Berkeley. You're on about health. Hi, um, it's Anna, and thank Anna. you. <laughs> I actually, I just was moved to call. I'm not sure exactly what I want to say, except that I love, I love to hear allies, <laughs> and you really feel like an ally. This is the work that you're doing, and the things that you're talking about are what are central to my life now. And after going through quite a few experiences myself. 
I just have decided that the only way that I want to live is to share the tools that I've learned to help others, and and you feel like an ally in that. And I'm wondering if there's a way to get in touch with you or if at the end of the program you'll be talking about that and if you're open to speaking with other people doing similar work. Well, Anna, I do have a website, dongroves.com, so you can contact me through that. So that's a very easy way to get in touch with me. But I do agree, you know, the word ally is such a powerful term. That's, that's, uh, it's a term that not only is appropriate for us as adult women supporting each other, and that's something that women do very well. It's one of our great strengths. But it's also something that we do when we work with children who are very stressed out or having problems in school. Uh, because there's, you know, there's stress that uh, adults experience, and then there's this this huge uh, amount of stress that children are going through, and um, we encourage them to develop allies at school, and that's the term we use, you know, other beings of like mind to support them. So it's wonderful that you're out there and doing this work consciously. Thank you. Well, let's, let's also give out numbers uh, to be able to get um, Don Grove's books. Um, you can call New World Library at 1-800-97-BOOKS or go to www.nwlib.com. Um, New World Library is just um, fant- they have just a fantastic place. Great people and lots of great books. So it's um, nice to talk to Don Groves, who has four books with them. So um, w- Don, can you talk to us a little bit about your yoga practice and how did you get into yoga and when? And yes, uh, I'm a big fan of yoga um, for a variety of reasons. I, I think that. Uh, if nothing else, yoga uh, makes me feel younger. It makes me feel physically and mentally younger. Um, I started yoga when I was in college, and I uh, was doing a lot of, of work for uh, the military back then. I was a military contractor doing uh, programming and writing, and I was under enormous stress, and my back just started to break down because stress, when we don't relieve it and work with it or manage it properly, it usually shows up in, in the area of our body that's weakest or that is our great messenger part. <laughs> and my great messenger is my lower back. So my back went out on me and I finally decided I needed to get serious about doing some body movement that was wholesome and not just um, aerobic. So I uh, got into uh, physical hatha yoga and studied it for a number of years and became a, a yoga teacher. And then, as with so many great things, Shalene, I became distracted by my world again and stopped doing it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And then my back got all screwed up again because it is my great gift in life. Uh-huh. And uh, so I started doing it again. And once again, I felt younger, better, stronger, um, more vital, uh, more vibrant. The neat thing about yoga is that I mean, not only is it is it um, a marvelous tool for your body and a marvelous way to um, uh, make your body healthier and more vibrant, but it actually, I mean, there's research on it now. It reduces the levels of cortisol in our body. Just one session, one 50-minute session of yoga, and cortisol is one of the stress uh, hormones that can, over the long term, be seriously damaging to us physically, and also uh, they're now feeling that it damages our short-term memory which is why so many people in their 50s are complaining and worrying about Alzheimer's because we can't remember anything. Uh, it's that stress, that long-term stress and that presence of cortisol. So not only does it do great things for the muscles in our body, but it also uh, makes a big difference in regulating how our hormones respond and uh, brings us out of the, the stress response. So I'm a big fan of it, and it doesn't have to be you know, two hours every day. It's something that I do three, four times a week, and I do it like before I talk on the phone or something. It makes a big difference in how how uh, competent I am as a person uh, just dealing with the ups and downs of life. Now, what about massage I mean, in terms of some of the things that we can do for, for self-massage? Yeah, massage is it's interesting. Uh, massage is... I, I got into massage when I was in college. I... Um, uh, I was living in San Diego, and at that time, 
did. The only people who did massage who weren't physical therapists, this was a long time ago, were prostitutes. Mm -hmm. And I decided I was getting very much into alternative health, and I wanted a great job that would get me through college, that I could claim my own hours. And so I started looking at being a massage therapist and working for a health club and uh, ended up taking classes and meeting lots of really interesting people and learning just about the enormous benefits that uh, massage gives you just in, in terms of just relaxing your muscles and, and moving the lactic acid through the body. But the challenge, of course, is that people have a hard time going to see massage therapists. They cost money, and uh, it's a time issue. And so uh, I wrote a book about self-massage, ways that we can work our own body and derive benefit from that, not the same kind of benefit as you get from a massage therapist because they're two entirely different experiences. But it's that little thing. It's a small thing that we do that makes a big difference. So if you're massaging your shoulder when it begins to get sore, not only are you addressing a body part that needs attention because the body is our great messenger and tells us when we're off balance, but it's also a momentary break and if you can use that in concert with focusing on the breath, just uh, thinking about something that isn't the current anxiety at the moment, taking a breather, you're cutting back on that build-up, build-up, build-up that so many of us live with that eventually breaks us down. So self-massage can be real useful. And do you um, have anything else besides the arms that would be easy to explain that someone could do for themselves that's helpful? Oh, sure. I mean, uh, massaging feet and calves is uh, very powerful. I mean, our feet uh, are, are so overburdened, and particularly with women, women's shoes. <laughs> so many of those heels are very damaging to our feet. Um, paying attention to the uh, nerve centers in the bottom of the feet and massaging the calves is such an act of self-love and caring. We forget as women to give ourselves the kind of love that we give to so many others and if you realize as you're massaging your calf like right now i'm doing that while we're talking and i'm i'm recognizing what this leg is doing for me and how it has helped me and how grateful i am for it for whatever condition it's in um it's a it's a mental um healing as well as a, a physical movement what can you tell us about Reiki? I know you talk about it in your book. I mean, people are talking a lot about that today, and I think it's a little harder to understand than the just some of the more well, traditional you know, forms I, I of really massage. Well, you know, I really can't talk too much about Reiki because okay. I'm not a Reiki master. Okay. So I'm not really a person that can give opinion about that. But I, I can say that I feel that any form of energy work and massage work, and that's what Reiki is is uh, useful when in the ha when uh, performed by somebody who is skilled and practiced at it. Don, we're going to take a call from Avery in Bay Point. Welcome to About Health. Hello, this is actually more about my friend Marcia from Manteca who uh, has volunteered at KPFA. Uh, she is busily planning to do something very um, dramatic. She's planning to walk cross country to the Statue of Liberty and back. Um, one thing that is particularly going to be interesting about this is uh, she weighs about in the mid-400s, so she may very well be the heaviest person to do this if she pulls this off. Um, she has a Yahoo group about it called Fat Girl Walking, um, and I would encourage anybody who's interested to join her group and uh, so you can provide support and, uh, and follow her exploits. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for calling okay. us and giving giving us that information. Um, now, can, can someone plan? You know, can you actually sit down and work out a plan if you're going to try to uh, work on your stress? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm a great believer in strategy, in strategizing, and women are very good at this because we can see what's coming up. You know, we can see around corners. Uh, we've got the awareness and we've got the intuition working for us. And if you know something's coming up, you can strategize around what may occur. Not in, uh, not in, like looking at the worst and saying, oh my god, this horrible thing's gonna happen and perseverating <laughs> on that. But rather from an intelligent perspective saying, okay, here's what's, what's a possibility. I can see that this may occur. How can I strategize to relieve my stress in case that happens? And then we can, uh, then we can benefit from, uh, what Epictetus says, which is, 
uh, quoting him, uh, What ought one to say then as each hardship comes? I was practicing for this. I was training for this. So strategizing is a powerful way to relieve that powerlessness that can come up when stuff happens. Most things don't happen unexpectedly. Some things do, and we have to deal with them. And a lot of times if we've, uh, if we've developed that kind of skill of saying, wait a minute, here's what's happening, I'm going to you know, move my body, narrow my focus, and take action, Stand we can relieve what's happening there. But stuff that's coming up that we have a sense about, we can strategize around. Sometimes that involves um, finding allies. Uh, if you're pregnant, you know you're going to have a baby in six months, uh, you know you've got work issues and support issues, then you can start cultivating what you're going to need now to deal with that then. Or if we're having uh, work problems coming up or we see something that's going to happen around the bend. Um, planning on some sort of... Uh, having some sort of a plan of action is very empowering. Don, a lot. we're going to have to close for today. We thank you so much for being our guest. Thank All you. the very best to you. And again, um, please call New World Library at 897 books or www.nwlib. And we're going to close with a poem called Dance in the Moonlight that I've written it's to women all over the world. Happy Women's International Day. People all over the world dance in the moonlight, pray at dawn, make offerings to the sun. We give to the goddess, we bless, we heal, we surrender ourselves and all that we have to what we believe in. Where did it all begin? What year? What age? What eon? What universe? What king or queen came first? What sage or saint? What religion? What shrine or wonder? Which man or woman the original one? What colors under the sun have we been and are we really? We must remind ourselves that we truly are one. No languages, maps, governments, customs, creeds, or histories, deeds can come between us. We're not alone. Why hold on to what we think we know or what we believe only to us belongs? My people are yours. Your people are mine. We can educate a planet, feed a world, reach over the oceans, cross the deserts, live in peace. Alone, I cannot learn all the languages, study all the ancient books, explore the glorious galaxies, cover every inch of our earth, though I would love to try. I need your eyes, ears, energy, hearts, faces, histories, herstories, babies, mothers, grandfathers, bright minds, and mystical dreams so that I can grow, so that I can change, so that I can forget who I think I am and remember who I am that I have forgotten. You must be my good fortune. You must be the face of heaven for me. You must show me that I am more than a piece of clay, of dirt, of earth. You must tell me that I am magic and mountain, lion and baby, proud peacock and beautiful swan. It's been so long since we were together. My ancestors are black and white, brown, red, yellow. I know some of their names. I've seen some of their faces. Some of them live in my heart, some in my blood, some in my pain. Who knows how many different lands they all cross, but every now and then, I seem to remember as I watch people sing in France, shine in Bali, smile in Bora Bora, kiss in Guatemala, hold hands in Nigeria, bow in Japan, laugh in Ireland, celebrate in Trinidad, reach out in Malaysia, pray in Egypt, give in China, love in San Francisco. I seem to remember. Thank you so much for joining us on About Health. We'll see you next week. Have a beautiful, beautiful day. I'm Shalene Qualls. Thank you. And my producer, our producer, Ranjita Giesler. We love her. Thank you, Ranjita. Today on International Women's Day, we bring the voices of children of KPFA 
as we read literature produced by great women. We are the children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, nieces, nephews, and friends of the Cape Cafe community. The thread that connects and runs through the readings is the love that children give to mothers, to women, and to mother. I see natural beauty cut up and left to rot. I take a deep breath. It reminds me of women treated with the same disrespect